Welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Theo Dunphy, and I'm the president of Global Citizen Circle. For almost 40, 50 years, I almost said 40, for almost 50 years, Global Citizen Circle has brought together people of varying ages and diverse backgrounds to share their stories, to listen deeply, to engage, inspire, and empower a global community of action. We've always highlighted the experiences of those who started early and stayed at it. We've had circles with world and community leaders from South African President Nelson Mandela to farm labor organizer Dolores Huerta. We've had conversations with elders and youth leaders from civil rights icon Coretta Scott King to March for Our Lives co-founder Lauren Hogg. And we've convened dialogues with peacemakers in Northern Ireland and in the Middle East, one of whom I'm happy to say is with us here again today. Today, during Women's History Month and the week following International Women's Day, we're celebrating the incredible perseverance, resourcefulness, and accomplishments of women around the world. But we're also grieving for those devastatingly impacted by war, famine, and displacement from home. Our discussion leaders today, Monica McWilliams from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and Sakshi Chandra from New Delhi, India, will talk about both the successes, but also the challenges of women, particularly those from most vulnerable populations in making their communities and the world a safer, more caring and equitable place in which they and their children can survive and hopefully thrive. Many of you who've joined us today in conversation have similar stories and experiences that have informed your way of living and acting in times that demand strength, perseverance, and, and compassion. We hope that after we hear from our discussion leaders, you'll share your stories with us as well. By listening and learning from each other, we can all move forward with more confidence and assurance that we'll get through this time with the support of our global community of family, friends, entrepreneurs, academics, activists, and leaders. I'd like to thank our partner, Southern New Hampshire University, where Global Citizen Circle has a home base and where right now students are gathered in the Women's Center to participate in this circle. Hi everyone, and shout out to my SNU colleagues, Beth Anderson and Leanne Bowden for organizing this watch party. And I'd also like to thank our Belfast Northern Ireland partner, the Social Change Initiative, whose staff, mentors, and mentees participate in circles and enrich and enliven the conversations. It's with their support that we're able to continue to do what we've been doing since our founding in 1974. So now I'd like to introduce our discussion leaders. It's a great pleasure to introduce Monica McWilliams to all of you. I know many of you here today know Monica and you've worked right alongside her for years. So you know of her brilliance, her integrity, and her wit. But for those of you just meeting her today, let me tell you, you're in for a treat. Monica's memoir, Stand Up, Speak Out, My Life Working for Women's Rights and Equality in Northern Ireland and Beyond, which came out this year, chronicles her young life in a rural town, her education in Northern Ireland and in the US in city planning, her move into work with women and victims of domestic violence to her involvement in politics and peace, a place where women have most decidedly not been welcomed with open arms. She's taken her experience in all of these areas to other countries, including Colombia, Syria, Myanmar, and Rwanda. And she's listened to, learned from, and encouraged the many courageous women beginning their own journeys into politics and peace. I could go on and on about Monica, but I'd rather you have more time to hear from her directly. So thank you, Monica, for being with us today. Now let me tell you a little about Sakshi Chandra, who she is and why we asked her to be in conversation with Monica. We met Sakshi near the be very beginning of the pandemic when she participated in a virtual circle on a new generation taking the lead. She was in Mumbai at the time and working on a community project made possible by MCW Global, a wonderful nonprofit that provides leadership and mentoring opportunities for emerging leaders from around the world. 
As a graduate of MCW Global Program, Sakshi was working on creating safe spaces in the urban landscape of Mumbai as an outlet of security for women to discuss their realities of domestic violence and abuse. Since that circle in May of 2020, we've gotten to know Sakshi better and are thrilled that we actually had the opportunity to meet her in person in Boston last fall, as she's currently studying to get her master's in law and diplomacy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. She came to her studies with a background in human rights law and, the opportun and, and had the opportunity last summer to intern at the UN in the Department of Counterterrorism. She has her sights set high so that one day she can be in a position to lead big change. But I'd argue that all of the community work she's done with women and young children is already leading to change. As both Monica and our beloved International Advisory Board Chair, the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu have said, it is the myriad small actions that people take that leads to substantive and lasting change. I think you'll understand why we thought Monica and Sakshi were a perfect match for this circle discussion. And before I hand over the virtual mic to Sakshi to begin, I have a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions or comments during the discussion, please do add them to the chat. And then when we have an opportunity, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and tell us who you are, where you are, and then ask your question yourself. And if you're comfortable, please also open your video if you haven't done that, as we always like to see you. So, okay, now I'm gonna turn things over to you, Sakshi. Uh, great, good morning, everyone. Thank you for that very warm introduction. Welcome, Theo. Uh, and I'm just, I'm so excited to be speaking to Monica today. Uh, before diving into today's conversation, I would like to begin our time with a poem, uh, a poem called New Day's Lyric by the National Youth Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman. Everyone to mute at the moment. Can we mute everybody? except for our speakers. <laughs> Great, so. Sorry, Sakshi. Oh, muted. I guess I got muted too. <laughs> you got muted in, yeah. the, whole, in the whole Okay, thing. this is okay. just classic Zoom behavior. Yeah, it is, it is. We're gonna begin again. Uh, May this be the day we come together. Morning we come to mend. Withered we come to weather. Torn we come to tend. Battered we come to better. Tethered by this ear of yearning, we are learning that though we weren't ready for this, we have been readied by it. We steadily vow that no matter how we are weighted down, we must always pave a way forward. This hope is our door, our portal, even if we never get back to normal, someday we can venture beyond it to leave the known and take the first steps. So let us not return to what was normal, but reach towards what is next. What was cursed, we will cure. What was plagued, we will prove pure. Where we tend to argue, we will try to agree. Those fortunes we foreswore, now the future we foresee. Where we were not aware, we are now awake. Those moments we missed are now these moments we make. The moments we meet and our hearts once all together beaten, now all together beat. Come, look up with kindness yet, for even solace can be sourced for, for sorrow. We remember not just for the sake of yesterday, but to take on tomorrow. We heed this old spirit in a new day's lyric. In our hearts, we hear it. Ad lang syne, my dear. Alt Lang Syne. Be bold, sang time this year. Be bold, sang time. For when you honor yesterday, tomorrow ye will find. Know what we have fought need not be forgot nor for none. It defines us, binds us as one. Come over, join this day just begun. 
for wherever we come together, we will forever overcome. <laughs> to bring our focus to what is on everyone's mind, echoing words of Priscilla Lee, Global Citizen Circle Vice Chair, the invasion of Ukraine and the violent clashes around the world display democracy in an hour of deep distress. As Global Citizen Circle, we stand with those in crisis zone everywhere and are ever more committed to empowering a network that highlights strategies towards addressing the darkness of the hour. In recognition that we're not alone in our concern, Global Citizen Circle embodies hope in promoting a true global citizenship that galvanizes hope, mobilizes support, and encourages action. So big, to begin with today, here we are yet again facing a disparate, devastating war. Looking at the impact of war on women, whether the burden of displacement, sexual physical violence, or impoverishment continues far longer than the battleground and oftentimes for generations after. Recent estimates indicate that 54% of people in need of assistance from the ongoing crisis in Ukraine are women. More than 2.3 million refugees from Ukraine, the vast majority women and children, having fled to neighboring countries and others displaced within the country. And these numbers are expected to increase significantly as the offensive continues. So Monica, um, to begin with today, I'd like to ask you, what parallels do you see with what is happening today in Ukraine with your body of work over the past years? Well, it's, I think we're at a tipping point in the world now. And like the pandemic, nothing will ever be the same. And unfortunately, we've said that before about other horrendous um, wars, and I've most closely observed that in Syria, um, where we should have anticipated that there were, the red lines would get crossed. I saw the barrel bombs and indeed the use of chemical weapons by Putin, um, and then the impunity in which he was allowed to continue, and the huge um, displacement of six million people who are still my friends, and I'm going to Geneva um, next month um, because they're also still at the negotiating table and not getting very far because the Russians are also at that table. So but the question for me is, who's your negotiating partner? Um, and that's really difficult when human rights violations and crimes against humanity and indeed what's tantamount to a genocide is taking place. Um, and the big question is the role of the United Nations. Um, Ireland has a, a seat at the table at the moment, and that's one way that I'm um, pursuing the statements that are made. And I'm very pleased to see the stand that Ireland has taken. And the big question, of course, was about NATO um, and whether NATO should go in. And indeed, it's argued that the cause of Putin going to, into Ukraine was because of NATO that he felt threatened because of what had happened um, in places like Georgia, where I've been. Um, and I was there when the war occurred in 2008 and the invasion of South Ossetia. Um, and so the commonality of what I see is hatred. Um, and the, also this feeling that that empire belonged to us and we're going to get it back. Um, and also, how do you sit down at a table and decide the constitutional issues? Um, it, it also begs a huge question about democracy um, and more importantly for me, um, the universality of human rights um, and how those are, rights are being um, violated on a massive scale. So there's lots of questions at a pragmatic level. I've joined 120,000 families here um, who have signed up to take someone into my own home. Um, and also involved at the university yesterday sent yet another massive truckload of goods, um, mostly by students, which gives me great heart organizing that. And so it brings sometimes the best out of us. And what we see in the Ukraine is what happened in Northern Ireland. That the, when these moments come, it asks an awful lot of ordinary people to become extraordinary uh, leaders. And that includes the women. And I'm very heartened to see the women ambassadors um, speaking to us every day on our television. Um, the, UN, the, U, the Irish ambassador from the Ukraine is a woman. And indeed, we saw the women being applauded in the US Congress. 
um, and those magnificent women diplomats who are fluent in English taking to the microphones as well as taking to the streets. Um, I was very moved by a story I heard um, where a woman took her children across the border uh, into Poland, uh, left them there in safekeeping and returned because she was the person running the electricity plant um, in one of the eastern cities that was most likely to be overcome. Um, and of course, other women returning for those left behind. And what it shows us is it's the most vulnerable who can't move, as I saw in, in Syria, the disabled, the elderly, um, the people who, who cannot get up at a moment's notice uh, and leave. So it's a huge humanitarian crisis and it's a huge food crisis. Uh, because as each day goes on, there's more of a famine in those places that depended on Ukrainian and Russian wheat um, and many of the other agricultural products that in Russia are now sanctioned, but have now stopped because the farmers can't continue to produce. So it's not just a, um, a security crisis, it's a food crisis. Um, it's a safety crisis. Um, and we respond in whatever way we can. But it's also led me to a question is where it's going to end. And it was the same question asked in Northern Ireland after 30 years. And I pray that that's not the length of time it will take Ukrainian and Russian neighbours to come to an agreement. Um, but we also had to decide on consent of how we in the future would give our allegiance and how we would agree to a certain set of entitlements. Um, and that's really important. Um, but when those negotiations will take place, the first thing is to get a humanitarian corridor and a cessation of, con of hostilities, ceasefire in place, which we did. It was the notion of a ceasefire that led us to the peace talks. Um, but what then comes out of that? And I read, and I think I said to Fee, and I'll stop there, that there was a good piece in the Irish Times by someone who I don't know called Jared Toll. Um, he works out of West Virginia and um, tech. And he wrote that someday there will have to be a referendum. Um, the referendum should be held in the territory um, of the pre-war uh, Donetsk and Luhansk regions and allow three status options, returning to the Ukraine, second in, uh, independence or joining Russia. And Russia and Ukraine would commit to respect the results of that referendum and to allow dual citizenship and an open border for freedom of movement. Well, all of that is what we had to do. We have dual citizenship now in Northern Ireland. We will have a referendum in terms of our constitutional uh, future. Um, but all of that has to be prepared for. And that I say 25 years after I signed the agreement that we are still negotiating our way out of conflict. So I have no doubt that Ukraine will be doing this for some time to come. But first and foremost, we have to reach out and try and respond in whatever small way we can to this humanitarian crisis. And we've offered our home um, for six to nine months in the first instance. And I'm going to have um, an extension put on the back of my home so that I can offer that place longer term if this war goes on to a family with children. And I learned that from Elmer and Jim. When I first spoke to them, they told me about how they brought uh, young students who were attending New Hampshire university um, into their home and it was for a long time um, and I my sister and I left that day thinking what an incredible contribution to peace building that is um, and it might sound small but it's huge um, and for that reason um, and I would like to think that Eleanor and Jim had a huge role in um, playing in making our decision yesterday uh, to take a family as soon as possible into our home for as long as it's needed. I think Monica, when you uh, when you when you speak about this, it's it's interesting because you talk about small and big ways you can contribute in a positive way, and at the same time, I think I find this interesting parallel about the way that oppression is experienced, whether in different culture, different time, different circumstances, different geography, um, on the battlefield, on war zone, and in homes, <laughs> in homes where people exist, living everyday lives. Um, something that you mentioned in the book is about conflict violence and everyday violence being indistinguishable when it comes down to everyday experience of people trying to live a life of dignity. 
with that, I can't I can't help but think about the verdict of the High Court in Karnataka, India, which just uh, came two days ago, effectively upholding a ban on hijabs in schools and colleges. So for someone who's a Muslim woman waking up in India in the morning, you have to look at the constitutional mandate to make a decision about what you cannot or can wear on a simple giving morning. Growing up, I've been asked to cover myself by my mother and by relatives constantly. It's almost like that sheet of shame about experiencing my own body, whether privately or publicly, um, whether that be in the way I dress or how I look was rooted in me at such a young age that now something as simple as making my own decision about the clothing that I wear makes me feel liberated. And I think what it also does is that you start to perceive yourself from the eyes of the world. Um, as I recall from the second chapter of your book, where you must be all of 15 years old, um, and I quote, the boys were given much more freedom while we were expected to behave like modest convent girls. Um, I can't help but think about having my body or women's bodies being policed all their lives, whether that be for reproductive rights, depending on where you are geographically, or again, something as simple as choosing to wear when you want to what you want to. Um, and to bring this back to the fact that this is a shared and recurring experience for young women, women who are my friends, my colleagues, strangers across time in 2022, the same thing that you experienced in 1970. Um, so Monica, how is it that <laughs> the government exerts this control and the society exerts this control on women's bodies? Because as I seem to know about men, they just have to have clothes on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why, in your opinion, has this not changed? And why do you think this is so pervasive that we're not seeing progress here? Well, uh, I think that's remarkable that you're making that connection because we are connected. Um, even though our cultures are different, there are norms and customs in all our cultures and they're so gender specific um, that they do subordinate the role of women. Um, I was taught to kind of dislike my body um, never to show it naked. And indeed, when the convent first got us um, showers for our physical education classes, uh, we wore our swimsuits um, because we were told um, not to expose, expose ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And I told you the story the other day about how when I went to pick strawberries at a summer camp, the Scandinavian women started running down the corridor towards the showers without even tiles around them. And I was absolutely shocked. I couldn't, I couldn't bear the image of these amazing women. They were like Amazons to me, running down the corridor, singing, shouting on their way to rub and scrub the, the mud off them, whilst I wrapped myself in about six towels um, and walked down and still kept my swimsuit on because I was still at the convent school and I couldn't bear to go against the norm of having my naked body there. So I was thinking they were um, out of order um, and they thought I was out of order. And it was that kind of clash and we were all Europeans, of course. Um, so it's really trying to understand and look at us today. Of course, we wouldn't think of doing that, nor would we say that to young women in a shower. Um, but it took me a long time to get those norms out of my head, to get those customs out of my head um, and to have a, a positive, more positive image of my body. Um, and that struck me politically when strip searching um, as um, in the prisons for the women, uh, the combatant women who were arrested. Um, and I started with the other trade unionists, a campaign against strip searching the prison directors called it body searching uh, they didn't like the word strip but strip it was because they were naked and they had dogs barking at them um, um, it was females who did the searching but that didn't really matter to the women who were forcibly stripped because they were refusing to take their clothes off and these were catholic women who had also gone to the same schools convent schools who felt that it was the use of power and control rather than the use of searching for weapons or drugs or whatever else might be taken in. So later, when I became Human Rights Commissioner and an overseer for the prison reforms, that was the very first issue I tried to tackle. Um, how do we do this safely for all women in prison to make sure that drugs and weapons aren't imported, um, but also and to do proper risk assessments rather than strip women on the day of committal 
into an institution where they will have very little power or control, um, but in a way that is there, which was to demean them and to take away their self-esteem if they had any, and they were already in a prison. So I say that when you're in the, in the care of an institution and that institution is run by a state, you have a bigger duty of care, a statutory duty of care. But of course, what we were proposing was seen as a villain's charter. Why would you even care? So it was very hard for us, and like you probably, and I watched those pictures coming in from India, uh, to embed a culture of rights, to embed a respect for the culture of rights. And that issue that you've raised for the, about the hijab is a really important one in terms of what limitations are put on the freedom of religion. Um, but how, what choice do you also give like to women like yourself that this is um, not necessarily a custom that every woman has to adhere to. Um, so all of us find these things imposed on us in different ways. And as a result, you can end up in deep water. Um, but I find that using the human rights standards um, really stood me in good stead. This was about dignity. It was about respect. Um, and for women, I then made the gender specific argument that things happen to women that don't happen to men. And in particular, because of menstruation at each month, they, this was a particularly humiliating thing to do. Um, and that argument still stands, that sometimes you have to also address violations from a gender specific lens. And I try to say that in the book. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Monica, talking about uh, sort of the prison system and experience of a woman inside structures, I would say. So if we're talking about the common woman, um, I think structure is also inside the home. And I think I want to bring this conversation back to violence against women and some alarming statistics about violence against women. The fact that it remains devastatingly pervasive, starts alar alarmingly young. Um, according to World Health Organization across their lifetime, one in three women around 736 million women are subjected to physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner or sexual violence from a non-partner. Um, according to a Justice Department analysis of violent crimes, 80% of rapes and sexual assaults go unreported in America. In India, the numbers are even staggering. According to National Family Health Survey data, 99% of cases of sexual assault and violence go unreported. Um, I think uh, personally, the biggest gift to survivors on International Women's Day would be to correctly label violence against women a men's issue. As we understand how the framing of a social problem happens will always impact the solutions we come up with. It seems ludicrous that we call men's violence against women a women's issue and speaks volume to who we hold accountable and responsible to ensure that such incidents stop. Um, growing up, and frankly, even now, when I'm miles away from home, I've had multiple conversations with my parents about managing my behavior or how to prevent sexual assault as a woman. And at the same time, I know that my male friends have never had this conversation with their parents um, to understand for them at a young age that consent cannot be convinced into. Hesitation is not a window for you to try harder. Rejection is not a sign for you to try again, and silence is not a yes. Focusing on that, um, <laughs> I think an incident that also comes to my mind, having worked with survivors of violence and their families, is, in the, is, is the one in which, having been part of family mediations, um, I found that it was a hard task for me to bring even closed family members to believe a survivor. So much stigma, so much shame attached to being someone whose dignity was inflicted with violence, it comes as no surprise to me that these are the current statistics. Uh, Monica, I'm curious, how do, you, how do you think that we overcome this narrative of blaming the victim as a community? And also, over the years, we as women internalize this. So how do women overcome this internalized social conditioning to blame themselves for what happens to them. Well, I thought it was important in the book to start off explaining what happened to me. Um, I, I, at a very young age, 14 years of age, old, I um, realized that I was on the verge of being raped when I took a lift after a hockey match. I was still in my school uniform 
um, and luckily had enough wit to sense that I was in danger when the driver of the car said, if you make it worth my while, um, I'll take you all the way home. Um, realized that I was in serious trouble on a dark evening. Um, and could I worked it out that he had to take a fork in the road about a hundred yards up. And that if he slowed down sufficiently, I could jump out of the car, um, which I did. But you mentioned um, the issue of being able to talk about that. Um, my father came, I called him from the pub up the road to tell him that I needed a, a lift home. Um, and he told me how wise I was to call him and not to be taking a lift from strangers. Um, and I couldn't answer him. I said, that, yeah, that's right. I didn't tell him. Um, and that led me to be more careful after that. But also I, I was, I had felt pretty invincible as you do as a young teenager and then realized the world was not the place where I could feel invincible. I never did hitch a lift after that alone. Um, because of the troubles, of course, later, you know, we stopped hitching lifts completely because my boyfriend was murdered in 1974 as a result of hitching a lift. Um, but we also need to remember that most of the violence against women is not by strangers, it's by intimate partners. And that's what I say in the book in a chapter called Bringing It Out in the Open. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased when I um, went into the bookshop yesterday um, in the local town here that the bookseller said, um, I really liked your book. And I thought he was immediately as a man going up to go on to say, uh, particularly the chapters around the peace agreement and the stories that were never told. And he said, particularly the chapter on violence against women and girls. Um, and it really moved me. Um, and then he went on to say, because my mother was a victim of domestic violence. Um, and I thought, yeah, probably, because one in four are. Um, and so breaking the silence, um, taking the shame away, reclaiming the agenda um, and saying this is not gender neutral. That's the battle for the last 20 years I've had in Northern Ireland as I worked towards changing policy and legislation. Um, strangely enough, one of the um, peace agreements, pieces of legislation called Section 75, which was the equality clause, um, meant that any work that we did on women had to also apply to anything we were going to do with men. So my first piece of work over 25 years ago that I wanted to repeat after the ceasefires um, to see what difference peace made was on women, with women. And the government told me, no, that that section 75 meant that I had to equally apply and have as many male interviewees as I had women interviewees. So it was the misinterpretation of the human rights standards that, you know, where it is gender specific and where there is an overrepresentation in this case of women victims and survivors, they should have that research undertaken. So my point again was that our data wasn't being collected properly. Um, I think I say that in the book. Um, the book was edited, so I wasn't able to tell a lot of it, but I discovered that they were saying as many men were being abused in um, intimate partnerships as women. But the, the question they forgot to ask was, was it nearly non-fatal strangulation, which is the new term now for almost a near-death experience, which we've just made into a crime last week? Um, or was it a case of where the woman was defending herself and proactively pushing against the man and hitting him as, he, as she did so. And that was taken down as equivalency. And so all this research was beginning to show there was no, um, it was not a symmetry. It was a symmetry that as many men as, as women were being abused. And that really shows you the corruption of data and the lack of uh, good information. So that's the kind of work I started doing. Information, education, agitation. And the agitation was to get the policies and the legislation to address this. And they have this last week. And because the assembly is about to collapse and we're about to have an election, we had three big pieces of legislation pushed through. Somebody described it as McDonald's handing out chicken nuggets before it closed its doors, and giving you extra. And so we got three big pieces of legislation through on stocking, 
on that strangulation issue um, and on coercive control. And yet I'd spent 20 years working for that, those pieces to be brought in. But the patience and persistence is what we need. But thank you for that question. And I was determined when I wrote the book that I wasn't going to leave my own personal experiences and have, having observed friends who did have sexual assault. And in the case of us being a student, a woman friend in the States when we were working as students in Wildwood, New Jersey, being raped. And she didn't report it because we were foreign nationals and we didn't know what we were going to say to the police. And we did not know if we would have to come back and go give evidence in court. And um, it was just a pretty awful. So we stayed quiet and protected her. Um, uh, but today we stand up and speak out. And today we have much better support services. Yeah. Monica, thank you so much for sharing that personal painful experience. I, um, I'm so sorry you had to go through that, but the, it's astounding that that's the reality of so many women across the world. Um, back to your point about the man who stopped you to talk about, this is something that my own mother experienced, violence at home. And the man coming out to you and I, I saw a tone of surprise that, oh, this is what he wanted to talk to me about. I think that that brings me to sort of thinking about why we need compassionate conversations about masculinity, the fact that young boys and men are also dealing with same fetters and constructs of gender where self-expression becomes difficult, conversations and access to mental health becomes difficult, peer pressure leads to deep-rooted behavioral patterns that young boys pick up. Um, and I think at the same time, recognizing that boys do learn about locker room talk and objectifying women at a very young age. Um, growing up, in the Indian school system, and then even in my young adult years as a law student, um, I have felt dehumanized with the soft violence of language that young boys have used around me, about me, or for my peers, even times when it did not necessarily attack me. Um, in the beginning, it it shocked me that my my peers and colleagues, when we're get, receiving the same education, why is this happening? Um, and then over time, it almost got normalized in my head. Um, and I think for the very same reasons, um, one of the projects that I worked on was around having these crucial conversations with young boys in their communities. Um, I think conversations which address and question the norms of masculinity, the expectations we have from our boys across social, cultural, or geographical differences, um, so, you know, whether that conversation is about consent or violence or peer pressure or gender or mm. anything more. Um, I want to I want to bring this conversation to like a living room of a common house, considering that um, you are a mother to young sons. Um, mm. Have you learned about raising responsible men? Um, I would like to think I have. Uh, the proof will be in the pudding. Um, but I like what I see in front of me. They're now in their 30s. Um, and one has just got married and is living in Chicago. And he's married um, into a Filipino family. Um, and I love their value system. And I hope that Rachel, my daughter-in-law, will love the, I hope, uh, the value system that I tried to raise my son in. Um, but as I say, um, if, you know, I'm not looking over his shoulder. He's an adult now. Um, and the same for my younger one, but I felt I needed to put that also in the book, um, that you bring it home, um, because they watched um, the humiliation that I had to experience. Um, it was caught in television um, by in the, in the elected chamber. Um, and Jerry and Eleanor uh, and the good Dumphy clan that used to bring friends to Northern Ireland will remember sitting in the visitor's gallery when they watched the behavior um, of elected male politicians bonding together and humiliating two women. We were the only women. Um, and I'm not sure you were there that day, Jerry, but if it is a little fib that I tell in the book that you and Eleanor observed me being mooed at, moo, 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 um, as I tried to make a speech um, on agriculture and was told that we were cows um, to go home um, that we shouldn't be uh, to go home and, and stand by your man. And we used good humour that day and other days, and we sang the song, Stand By Your Man. 
uh, to show that they weren't getting to us, but they did get to us. Because in the book, I say every Friday morning, I literally had to park the car and put on a body armor before I walked into that forum. Uh, I try again to say that it was meant to be a forum for dialogue and understanding. Um, as part of our peace talks that met in parallel three days a week and we renamed it the forum for monologue and misunderstanding. Um, but it was pretty awful every Friday morning because they were venting the frustration of being locked up at the secret peace talks. And here they were in a public forum and it was some kind of therapy to pour this vitriol um, across the chamber. I've heard from journalists since and I wasn't able to put it in the book uh, because the journalist didn't want me to name him, that a group of those politicians called us um, unbeddable wenches. So you can imagine, and we were a political party who were elected. I'd love to have been able to have put that on the, note, the insult of the week notice board. Um, but a lot of it was also sexist when I stood for election. Um, in by myself then later, uh, rather than the whole team um, of women's coalition that brought us into the peace talks. After the talks, we decided that we wanted to be part of the peace implementation of the agreement. So we had, had to stand alone um, as the women's coalition representative in South Belfast. So my posters went up and there were very few of any women. We could count them in one hand who were standing for election. Um, and my sons would come home from school and tell me, Mum, please go out quickly to the lamppost and take your poster at time because they've put a penis in your mouth. Um, and so as quick as I could, I would get the kitchen ladders out and climb up that lamppost and take down that poster uh, because it was pure misogyny. But I often wondered what impact it would have on my sons. Um, um, and I hoped it wouldn't turn them into angry young men, but they realized, and they were only six and eight at the time, um, the image that was being portrayed of their mother uh, in a public elected position. Um, so if that's what they were doing to someone um, who was being elected. And so at the time of the talks, Sashka, we said, um, if there's going to be a transition from peace, from conflict to peace, this has to be the part of the transition, these attitudes towards women. Um, and also, if there's going to be a transformation, which everybody talked about, like John Hume, we said, it's not just the guns that need to be decommissioned, it's the mindsets. And if this is part of the mindsets, um, because not all violence stops on the day you signed a peace agreement. And certainly that was, we wanted the violence of the political conflict to stop, but we were very aware that the violence and abuse of women would not stop because we'd signed a peace agreement. But I like now working with other women in international situations that when we do these capacity building workshops we demand that as part of the ceasefires there is a cessation of rape and sexual assaults because that's also a weapon as we saw in Bosnia as we saw in Central Africa and God forbid I hope we do not see it in Ukraine um, that it and that's a weapon that's sent to a message to the other side that we can appropriate your women um, and becomes a weapon of war. But, you know, as I say, it was also intimate partner violence and we called it intimate terrorism um, because I counted the number of women who were being murdered uh, every year as part of my study. And I was able to prove in one year that in quite a few years there were more women um, homicides by men on them in who were their partners than there were in the conflict that was getting so much attention. Um, so for all of those reasons, I think you're absolutely spot on. Um, and I, at a great event last Saturday called Feminism in Schools, we had hundreds of young students turn up at an integrated school, which there aren't that many of here, which means Catholics and Protestants being educated together. Um, and I walked around the stalls afterwards and the workshops that were going on and was just amazed at the activism of this generation of young women who are standing up and speaking out against this, um, the norms, the customs, but also putting in place great services. Um, and it just, it just warmed my heart. So it also gave a good name to the word feminism, which again, probably in India, like Northern Ireland and some places of the United States is so frowned upon. 
Yes. Sometimes <laughs> that F word that we it's use is seen as derogatory as the other one that we're not allowed to use. <laughs> um, so um, it was a day of celebration. I think it's, um, yeah, uh, it's interesting when you talk about your younger self and um, how you were in your younger days. And I think that that makes me curious and I want to shift the conversation to that. Um, you were also an international student in Detroit, um, deeply impacted by the issues that you saw at home and abroad. Um, and as I understand, you embodied different identities. Um, as an Irish woman, a young woman, an international student, a working woman, a public woman. Um, so I think I wanna ask you about your struggles with identity. As a young person, I often feel compelled to be wholly consumed by one identity, maybe just to survive or rather than having all my identities on full display. Um, celebrations of identity are so empowering because they liberate us. Uh, so did your younger self or former self struggle with identity? What would you say to younger generations now who are struggling with owning multiple identities, whether it be their gendered identity, their sexual orientation, mm -hmm. ethnic or cultural identity? Um, and I think just simply owning themselves, especially when they're at odds with the world, maybe in the closed doors of a home or maybe outside in a classroom. Yeah, there was lots of discussion in our home. Um, because it was the time of the civil rights um, mm -hmm. and we were watching um, what was happening in the United States because we just got black and white television in 1965 um, and so that was the first image of uh, I guess of the United States and the civil rights movement and those great activists and and the diversity of that movement in support mm -hmm. of civil rights and it was the first learning that came into my head that you can't stand up for your rights um, because we get, I guess growing up where I grew up in a small village in a rural area we didn't think we had very many rights and we didn't actually think we were entitled to many rights and I say that as a young woman but I also say it as a young woman living in a very discriminatory place where the right to housing, fair housing, fair employment and, mm -hmm. and votes um, were not taken for granted those were the rights we started marching for. So that was my first kind of framing around my identity. But then I realized, as they say in the book, how male that movement was. I didn't question it. I just took it as a given that that movement would be predominantly male. One man, one vote. Right. Um, and I carried that placard with pride. Mm -hmm. Never thinking for one minute, one man, one vote. Mm, that's not me. <laughs> Um, because that was the, that identity came later um, and it came in the women's rights movement. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the movements give you the awareness about your own personal identity. I love today that there is so many different identities and the census in Northern Ireland has just occurred and no doubt the results will come out and whether people sign in as British or Irish or Northern Irish which apparently is the new identity. Um, and it is that group, that new identity that will determine the future, the constitutional arrangement of mm -hmm. this country. Um, so we still struggle. It's the biggest issue of all, and no doubt for Ukrainians, as we see for the demagogue in Russia, that that's the biggest issue for him. Um, and, you know, you cannot force an identity on anyone. And so that goes also for sexual orientation and it also goes for gender and it goes for race. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's really important that we realize um, when people didn't have an understanding of multiple identities. I prefer my multiple identity. When Jane and I were asked to redesignate um, to put the first minister in, he didn't have enough folks in that first assembly, in the legislative assembly. And we were, our identity was designated as others because we came from both sides. And at that time you had to be nationalist or unionist. Um, and we decided in order to give First Minister David Trimble an extra vote, Jane would redesignate that day for, which the, the rules allowed as unionist and I would redesignate as nationalist. 
Um, and we both laughed and that we said, well, shall we re identify as a European unionist, a trade unionist, or what kind of unionist? Um, and we got, you know, huge pushback from those who thought we were just making the rules up, but we wanted to really show them that identities can be multiple. Um, and I prefer the idea of being connected, uh, connected to Europe. Hence, uh, I feel a bit of the, the UK has gone through a process of self-harm um, recently in terms of the whole Brexit stuff. And definitely now we see um, the outcomes of that. But the, um, I really do like the idea that no one identity defined me. Right, right. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Monica. It's it's funny when you were talking about this, I I suddenly remembered the first time I was crossing into America in the form, in the immigration form. I was, uh, I'm called an alien. Um, yeah, me too. Alien entering into the country. And yeah. um, it's so funny because I had a reaction to that. It's yeah. like, an alien? I did not feel welcome. I did not feel... Um, just, just I feel like so much impact around the language we use politically, yeah. Yeah. as a tool to, yeah, as a tool to uh, segregate, yeah. as a tool to divide. It is and, a strange term, isn't it? I think yeah. somebody in, in the United States should do something about that word. Um, I thought it dropped out from the sky the day I landed, as that young student, um, yeah. and the immigration officer said to me, "Here's your number, and remember it." Um, and, you know, handed me my alien card. Um, and in the book, I say, I think he said, welcome to United States, but I can't remember. <laughs> I was still in such shock, but I'll tell you when it really hit me. When I had to go and register in Chicago in 2014, well, and I was a visiting professor and I went down to the social security office and anybody who knows the south side of Chicago, way over on 55th Street and beyond, it's a very poor district. And I went in on a quite cold day. It arrived around March. It was still snowing. And I walked into a social security office that I thought I could have seen anywhere in Central Africa. It was full of disabled people, vulnerable people. It wasn't warm. It was not well resourced. And there was the picture of, President, of Vice President Biden and President Obama over the, I don't know, you don't call it, do you call it social security? Um, where you, you you go and sign in and people yeah. were there to get their unemployment benefits as well yeah. Yeah. Um, so and welfare cool. benefits. And I was just sitting there in shock. Um, and then I had to go to the window that said alien. Um, and then up above the window, I looked up and there was President Obama and Vice President Biden. And the nice man behind the counter said to me, oh, you're from Ireland. Um, mm. And I said, I am. And I said, just as a matter, and it was around St. Patrick's Day. And I said, last St. Patrick's Day, I actually was with your president and vice president. Um, but I find it really strange to stand at your counter today as an alien. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was I, just this juxtaposition of, of uh, who yeah. you are. And, yeah. uh, the constantly, I think, seeing yourself um, through the eyes of the world. Yeah. Um, I would like to take a pause here and welcome questions, reflections, um, thoughts, and comments from the audience. Um, I will need some help from Theo here. If um, anybody who wants to go ahead, please feel free to unmute yourself and be on video and ask your question for Monica and, uh, and we can move forward from there. Thank you. Thank you, Sakshi and Monica. Um, I first, I'd love to call on Alice Barume. Um, I think she was the first person to put a, a, a question in the chat and Alice joining us from Rwanda, are you there? love to hear your question. Thank you so much, Theo and Monica and Tata for the great conversation. I really enjoyed the conversation. I, uh, I was really interested in Monica's testimony. It is really strong and helpful. I, I am happy to learn a lot from her as I didn't know any information about her, but from her testimony and the conversation she had with Sashka, I think it was really great. And I'll be happy to have the book so that I can go through it and learn a lot about it. And the question I have as we are in a young generation, um, I think I didn't introduce myself very well. I'm working with the SNHU Global Education Movement and I'm one of the Global Citizen Circle Youth Advisory Board member. My question is about 
how do you think someone you can help young women or girls to speak up about the uh, violence? I mean, about the violence and it might be domestic or sexual violence that are being done to them without being scared or worried about the society judgment because most of people are really facing this either in their family members or in their friends or the community, but they are really scared or worried to speak up about it. What do you think can be done to let them be free and you know, for them to be open to speak up about their issues without being scared of what is going to happen next? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. I actually visited Rwanda in 2019 with Interpeace that I chair at that time. And I learned more from what was happening in Rwanda around self-help support groups, um, psychotherapy groups, way out in the rural areas, not just in Kigali. Um, and I brought that experience back and said to our trauma support groups here that we should link up with the groups in Rwanda. Um, I think it was because the world was so ashamed, the UN in particular and others, Europe were so ashamed of not supporting what people were crying out for when the genocide occurred, that a lot of resources have been put in much better into Rwanda um, around not just physical health, but mental health and the impact of trauma. Um, and we learned from the impact of trauma on victims. And of course, as you know, in Rwanda, the extent of rape was a massive. Um, and so when I sat there in that meeting in the little room surrounded, and I have the picture in the book of women telling us how they were healing, initially shunned because of the rapes and also having to tell their children in future years um, how they were born and who their biological fathers were, um, but shunned by their own families, as I saw also in Uganda, in the Gulu region, northern Uganda with the girl soldier, girls who had been raped by the child soldiers, um, and to lift this notion of uh, the stigma um, that you have dishonoured us. And the same in our community, exactly the same. We did not have in any way the same scale of sexual assault. So one day, the more and more women are starting now to come out and speak about what happened um, in terms of sexual abuse on their own side not necessarily by the enemy side. Um, so the support groups are hugely important and resourcing those, and they tend to be women's support groups from the ground, the bottom up, resourced and accessible. And then you move on to talking about how legislation and policy needs to change. And the arts, um, a young woman I had the experience of having to support, one of the Mitchell scholars, um, named after Sandra Mitchell, who chaired her talks, and there have been scholarships set up. And Winnie Lee, if you look her up on the internet, is a remarkable young woman who has written a book about her experience being raped in Belfast at the 10th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and she then, it's gone on to be made into a film, a movie. Um, and she has now created um, a theatre for survivors and arts around those who have been raped and sexually assaulted. And it's a festival. Can you imagine a festival um, that deals with these subjects in a way that's to take away the shame and the stigma? Um, but then legislation, I spent my life working on the court service, the criminal justice system and the civil justice system. Um, and finally, we're starting to put in um, protective measures because like you and everywhere, and uh, uh, as we heard earlier, the, the number of successful prosecutions is tiny. It's only 3% here. Uh, which means that 97% are failing. Um, and why? It is because they don't have confidence in the justice system. As I say, it has to be a court of justice, not just a court of law. And so I find huge withdrawal from the system, um, from those victims and survivors who had no confidence that it was going to work. So now we've turned it around and we're getting the judiciary, the court service, the prosecutors all trained um, and also victim support and victim centered approaches where the victim does not have to stand up and face her accuser, or the, the uh, person who is at that stage still being accused. Um, and I've seen it too often um, where he puts a finger across his throat to show that he will 
And, and if you didn't know these signs, you wouldn't know that he is sending her visual messages because he's not allowed to speak. So now we have screens and around the victims in court, we've got video um, testimony that if the person is vulnerable, they do not have, and we've done this for children, but now we're doing it for adults, that they don't have to stand in court, um, that they can give the evidence remotely. And we've also got third party where the police can come in with their cameras and their evidence without necessarily having uh, the victim in court. So all of that has been recent, but it was much needed. Um, and that is making a huge change. Um, so I guess I would hope in Rwanda that you've got to that stage because you have got um, a cohort, a critical mass of women in your parliament. Um, but what I saw on the ground in, in, in Rwanda, Alice, I have to say I was very impressed with um, and that we in other communities, and especially in my own, could learn a great deal from. Uh, I'm sure you feel that you could go much further in Rwanda, as we all do in our countries. Um, but you have certainly showed us the importance of, and here, let me make this point, the importance of employment to go alongside counselling and therapy, to allow that person to be independent, to walk with dignity, um, even if it's small projects, credit projects, agricultural projects. And I love the day I left that group and other groups, they were carrying me carts of potatoes to take back to Ireland. Um, I didn't like to say to them, we have got a lot of potatoes in Ireland, um, but it was the graciousness in which it was done. Here is my product. This is what I have bring to market. This is what I make my own money from now. This is how I can hold my head up high. Um, I am no longer dependent on that person um, or persons who were subjecting me um, to a lot of abuse. Um, and, and they helped each other through that. So I brought back the message here that it's not enough for us to provide protection and refuge and shelter. We also had to protect, to provide training, employment, opportunities, education um, uh, and safety. Um, so that the woman with her child, the best protection for a mother was the protection. The best protection for the children was the protection of the mother. And if we can give resources and allow for independence of the mothers, uh, to walk on and partners to walk on um, it, with holding their heads up with some dignity. Um, and the more they can then talk about what happened to them um, and say, look at me, I've done it and I will be here to help you do it too. So those are the things I learned, Alice, in Rwanda. Thank you, Monica. We have quite a few um, people commenting in the chat and some questions. I see Janet, Dewar Bells hand is raised and I definitely want to hear what she has to say. Um, so um, why don't we, we'll go right to you, Janet, um, with your question. And then I'm going to ask um, if uh, Sudi would like to say a few words. You've put a lot in the chat. I'd love to hear from you as well. So um, Janet, take it away. Well, well, thank you very much. I just wanted to say that this conversation is so impactful and inspirational and I just wanted to say to Monica I know she hasn't been able to read the chat but I said earlier that I was sending serious love to you for your courage and your brilliance and your grace uh, and I just want to say how poetic you are in describing some of the highest points and some of the lowest points of humankind and I just and, and just thank you so much and and it's just been it's just been a wonderful uh, experience to just listen to you, and and have and to listen to this conversation. That's that's really all I wanted to say. I have no question. I just want to listen and learn. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. It's always wonderful to hear from you, um, Sudi. Are you still there? I know you've you've put a few comments about. You, you yourself as a lawyer, um, you mentioned some um, issues about laws, and we'd love to hear what you are thinking. Yeah, um, thank you so much. This, um, I, I kept thinking as I was listening, um, this is soul food. Um, it really has, has uh, as much as it, some of it is so heartbreaking, uh, you know, I think about 
um, certainly what's happening in Europe, but also in Afghanistan and in um, and in Palestine and all the the very various groups of mostly women that are um, and children that are the victims of um, really men in power and the decisions that they make um, because their power is challenged. Um, and, and you know, my, by way of background, um, I. I'm an attorney and I was a public defender in the United States. And one of the things, and domestic violence has always been a, an issue that I've thought a lot about that I'm doing work with now. Um, and, and certainly what I wanted to do to begin with when I was going to law school. I will say like one of the things that I've noticed is that, you know, in the United States, we created laws like the Violence Against Women Act. And in practice, um, those laws, as uh, as they were used in the courtrooms, they were implemented by people, oftentimes police officers, I mean, just like soldiers. So many of these young men, um, and I will say young men because that's, it's still uh, male dominated, go into these fields. They're very young. They have next to no life experience. They get next to no training. Um, and then they're given a power and a, a gun and a badge, and they're said to go and investigate these incredibly sensitive scenarios. And in the United States, one of the things that they started doing in a lot of states is they would require mandatory arrest. So you wouldn't even have a choice as to whether or not you arrested someone. And that could be the sole breadwinner. It could be the uh, the immigrant family who it could mean that they get deported. And as a result, the primary uh, financial support in the family is suddenly gone and they lose their job. Um, the woman oftentimes wasn't empowered to make a decision as to what the next step would be. So what would happen is they'd get told, you know, you called the police. Now the power is up to us whether or not to prosecute. And so what happened is I would find, you know, and I represented the person accused. Um, but oftentimes I would find that the woman would start siding with the person that was accused of assaulting them or that was uh uh, violent towards them because the system was stacked against them. They either had the option of pushing forward and prosecuting and suddenly losing um, this person or, uh, um, or you know, essentially get risk at the, at the risk of getting arrested for a false report because now they're changing their story. It was just so, it was just so sad. And I, it was so frustrating because it became kind of about winning in those moments and not about the students. The other quick thing I think is really important to note is then the other side of it is also accurate, which is you would have someone who would go into the system, let's say they'd get locked up and there's nothing that would prepare them to come back out into the world, um, a better human being, you know, more, better equipped to deal with their anger and violence and, you know, whatever trauma that caused them to appear before the courts to begin with. and so. Systemically, I think we have some real work to do because we create these laws, but we, we put them in the hands of people who have a lot of power who then turn around and don't know how to implement it without coming across as more abusive. And I worry, I worry um, that we're fo our focus isn't on making sure that when we give someone a, a gun and a badge or the power to be able to enforce these laws, that we're not thinking that we need to also in, make them realize that with great power comes great responsibility and you're destroying people's lives, including the person who you were meant to protect. So thank you so much for all your wise words and I'm so excited to read your book, thank you. Thank you for that and uh, just make a Another comment that warms my heart these days is that um, on all that training that's taking place now, um, Women's Aid is the organization I've worked with for 40 years, both in the shelter movement, but also at the courts um, and through, and obviously my own work in terms of policy and legislation. The thing that warms my heart is that they are now referred to as experts by experience. Whereas 40 years ago when we started out and we, Avla, my friend, squatted in the first shelter to set it up just as the troubles were starting. And they were seen as, and even the church had a responsibility here, where they were seen as people who broke up families. 
Um, and so we asked, you know, they said, keep the family together at all costs. And we asked the question at what cost? Um, so in response to you, that's right. It's, it's a systemic issue. It's about training and education. And I've done all that with the prosecutors, like with the court service, with the police. And then we've come a long way. It's an unfinished business. Um, but I love it that they are now turning to the NGOs and the women's organizations um, and those who have been in this field for 40 years, and they call them experts by experience. And this is the women who have lived through the violations and who are the survivors, whose voices were so rarely heard when you did the training. Um, so there is hope and, um, and I'm, a, I'm a witness to the changes. We've made huge changes. We did not, not do what you did because we learned from the States. We did not do mandatory um, arrests. We said the most important thing is to empower the woman to make the choice. And even if she goes back and back, someday she will make the decision to leave. And so the choice was the empowerment piece and it was giving back her the power and control rather than taking it away. And we learned that from the States that mandatory arresting um, and, and mandatory um, uh, imposition of making her go to court when she had to give testimony against someone who was the father of her child. Um, but it is frustrating and those in the front line know, as you do, how frustrating this work is. Um, but we have to believe that, that someday, and it's often soon, I found to, in response, and I've stopped after saying this, that when I did the first study, I asked, what did you do the first time? What did you do the worst time? And what did you do the last time? And what I discovered was the last time could have been something insignificant, like a promising to be at a birthday party and breaking the promise. It wasn't the battered um, face or the ruptured eardrums or the massive marks on their necks with gums, with the nozzle bruising. It was the fact that they knew that the promises weren't going to be kept. Um, and so even that was a learning experience. Um, so it's always something small and symbolic that tells us this person isn't going to change. And it's time I got out of here. And then comes the next bit, because also we made a huge mistake. Social workers and care workers and even frontline workers pulled out and said, great, she's on, she's left. We, she doesn't need our help anymore. And that's exactly the time that you need the help. Uh, not obviously beforehand in terms of leaving, but all the studies now show that women are most at risk in the first six months because of that famous saying, if I can't have you, no one else will. Thank you, Monica. Um, there has really, there are, are a number of things that have been coming up in the chat and questions, and I'm, I'm not sure we'll be able to get to everybody, but I do want to ask if Ken's is available at in the Women's Center at Southern New Hampshire University. I think she had to put a question in the chat and we'd love to hear from a student from the university if you're able to. Can you hear us? We can. All right. Hi, um, I'm Ken. I was the one who asked the question. Um, I was just curious because I know you were talking about Monica. I know you were talking about how you've done this for a very long time and uh, you've kind of been like an activist for women for a long time. How do you like stay motivated? Because obviously there's just so much like negative, there's so much negativity that comes with it. And I know like even just listening for the, the hour about all the things that you've gone through and that I've heard other women have gone through, like, how do you stay motivated to continue to do this every day? That's a great question. And I always love when someone asks that. They normally say, how do you take care of yourself? Um, I'll put my hand up and say not very well. Um, and because I just keep on finding something that needs to be done. Um, my sister says my middle name should be um, Monica as soon as um, McWilliams, um, because everything is as soon as, and it's all about, I've got this to do. And as soon as that's done, I, I come out for a walk or, so I'm trying to get better at that. And I'm going to admit that I'm not good at it and I'm not the person to ask, 
um, how do you take care of yourself? I, I guess I have been very fortunate in having a good rock and a good support system. And that would be what I would say to anyone. Um, have a good friend. Uh, and, and we're not great at encouraging each other at times. Uh, we, uh, here in Ireland in particular, you were fortunate in the United States from a very early age um, to be encouraged to stand up and speak out. Um, and you've been in, and I love that. And I noticed that when I taught at Chicago, how incredible students were. They had no problem putting their hand up and asking questions. And I think that's a great culture and be very proud of it. Um, we're trying to pass that culture on. Um, and, but also to say to somebody, um, um, well done. When anybody used to say it to me, because I came from an Irish culture, I, I would immediately say something back that wasn't positive. It would be, sure, that old thing, I, that's nothing. Or if they would say, that's really good that you did that, I'd say, not at all, it's nothing. Um, and that's my culture. That was my custom. Um, my mother used to say, self-praise is no praise. And she's right. I mean, if you go around boasting about yourself, nobody wants to listen to you. Um, but at the same time, what I learned from um, you in the States was that it's also important um, to, to encourage and to empower. And so I had some, many of those people around me as friends um, who made me apply for jobs that I wouldn't have thought of applying for myself, uh, who pushed me into electoral politics when it was the last place I wanted to go. Um, and, you know, I've changed careers a fair few times and taken a fair few risks. Um, and I dedicate the book to my sister, who I say is my sole companion, um, as well as being my sister. And so either in your family or in your group of friends, make sure they stay close because you'll need them. Because um, it's tough, the work you do. Um, but I have been, uh, you know, I've been very privileged. And I'm glad you said that, you, that this has been a tough conversation. It has, and I didn't expect it to be. Um, and, you know, I, I want to reach out to both the men and women who have listened here today, because these are tough things, but there's been lots of joy in my life. And that's what I said in the book. Um, and hence the reason why we sang those songs on International Women's Day, as we marched down Royal Avenue. Um, and this is 40 years ago when International Women's Day wasn't that well known. And the song is called Bread and Roses. And if you get a chance to listen to it, um, do, because it's absolutely fantastic. It talks about the bread we need on the table. Um, but it also talks about the roses that we love that put joy back in our lives. And I'm very fortunate that I've had both bread and roses. Thank you, Monica. Um, I know we're running out of time and I, um, what I'd like to do is ask, um, I know that Marguerite Mariama had a question earlier on and I'd love to give her a chance to ask that question. And then I'm actually going to see, Marguerite is a, phenomenal singer and performer. And I, this is on the spot. So Marguerite, don't feel you have to do this, but boy, if you had a song that could close us out and uplift us, I think we could all use that. So Marguerite, ask your question and then you can either say yes or no on the song. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, good morning, good morning. Um, both Monica and Sakashi, thank you so much. Your presentations have been fabulous and so eye-opening um, and affirming, actually. And I, my question, Monica, is, um, well, let me just go back and say that I, I grew up in Chicago during uh, Northern Jim Crow, and I left Chicago and moved to New York for 30 years, moved back, and found it to be a very different city than I had left. And I'm wondering um, about your impressions of the city when you were visiting here as a uh, professor, especially specifically racial relations in Chicago. We have a very storied past and it's mm. still with us actually. Yeah. Um, well, um, Chicago is kind of my second home now because that's where my son has made his home. I was there uh, 40 years ago um, over 40 years ago. So I walked the streets of Chicago as a young student. I drove a car at the age of 21 from Philadelphia to California. Um, and we thought, oh, Chicago, there's a spot we'll stop at. Um, and I found it um, quite a dilapidated city. I was shocked, uh, really run down. 
Um, but again, impressive for us because we weren't used to high rise. And then I come back all those years later and find it totally changed. Um, but you are right. The thing that struck me most in terms of that year that I lived there in Southside Chicago was, was the racism mm -hmm. uh, and the way the police responded to it. And when I did the studies on domestic violence, you'll find this interesting. I was looking at the homicide rates, which were huge for domestic violence in Chicago. But the police weren't prosecuting it because it was a black woman murdering her black husband and they didn't care. Um, and, you know, I, I, I actually wrote about that um, compared to the amount of prosecutions we were having um, when the extraordinary happened if a white woman killed her white husband. Um, but more importantly, um, I was there at the time when the police were um, having real problems in terms of how they were responding um, and the shootings that were occurring. And one of those was in Chicago. Um, and I've more recently watched the mayor, um, Lightfoot, what's her first name? Um, the, the mayor of Chicago. Yes. Yeah. yeah, she's coming, um, a lot of pushback in terms of what she is trying to do, but I thought, you know, what she was doing was really groundbreaking um, in terms of raising the issue of race and policing. Um, and it's probably important that you to know that, and I have just come from the police ombudsman's office, for every murder that occurs here by a police officer as a representative of the government and the state, it's investigated. You know, a shooting, I shouldn't say a murder because sometimes it's in self-defense, but any shooting that a police officer does here is investigated and taken by the police ombudsman um, as automatic that that will go. And each time a taser is pulled, that's also investigated. And one of the good things about our peace agreement was that there was a human rights framework put into the foundations of our new police service. Um, and it has stood the test of time. Um, and there are very, very few shootings. I don't recall any, I actually call one um, in the last 20 years where a police officer has shot a citizen. So compare that. Um, mm. And that's also the case that we're unarmed. Uh, the police here are armed because of the conflict, unlike the rest of Ireland and the UK. Police officers are not armed in this country, nor do they want to be. So that's also a, a learning. Um, but I am um, surprised. I was surprised. I shouldn't have been surprised. What surprised me most was the first night I arrived on the Friday night um, and I got an email from the university saying, do not walk on the streets. There has been two people murdered on the corner. And I thought, I've arrived at a university in the United States, and this is the first email. Um, so that gives, gave me an indication that there was a kind of war going on there um, and that it needed to, to be tackled from the ground up. And clearly, some of the recent court cases are really showing the extent of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was sad when I went back to Chicago at Christmas um, and saw the impact of the pandemic. But also, my son told me not to take a walk outside the apartment because of the carjackings and a young 15 year old high school boy had been just murdered the night before in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I am on vacation from Belfast and this is what my son is telling me on Christmas. So it's very sad. Um, and it's, it's something that really is going to have to be tackled by the very, from the highest level of the system of why these figures are so high in a city like Chicago. Yeah, Lori Lightfoot is doing her best, but you know, it's, it's just, it's overwhelming because, yeah. because of the history. And no one wants to take a look at the history, the divided neighborhoods in, this, in, the, in the city um, contribute to uh, the disconnections and, um, and the sense of uh, white racial hierarchy that in some ways views black people, particularly black people of a certain class, as subhuman. So it, it, it enables them to treat them as if they, you know, don't yep. have, as, as if they're valueless. I, I'll send you a book afterwards that I got in Chicago and I should have known about it, where the person who wrote it, a journalist who is teaching in the, 
university there in one of the universities, De La Salle, I think, compared the methods of interrogation, the five methods of interrogation that were used against the five men here called the hooded men back mm -hmm. in the 70s. And they were exactly the same techniques of ter interrogation used against five African-American men arrested by the police at the exact same, around the same time. Yeah. And, and one got world attention and we took the case all the way to the European Court of Human Rights and it was designated as inhumane and degrading treatment. Unfortunately, it wasn't designated as torture, which it would be today. Um, and what he says in the book is, how come this was designated in this way in Europe, but in the United States, no one was paying much attention to this. Right. So I'll, I'll send the, to, to Theo afterwards the title of the book. It's an, a fascinating read in terms of comparing what was going on in Chicago and going on in Belfast at exactly the same time. Amazing. So yes, Theo, I have a little song, but it's a song that everyone knows. And um, I sing this, I, I love singing the song because it reminds me of my mentor, uh, Catherine Dunham, who, uh, who used to tell us students of hers, um, don't let your um, don't let your light burn out because the world will do that to you. So let's all sing together this little light of mine. <laughs> Especially women, we our beacons have to be real strong right now because we're going to be we're going we're the answer to the world's problems. We really are. So is everybody ready? <laughs> all right, let's go. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All right, everybody, let's go. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. You Welcome. rose to the task. We needed that. Um, <laughs> I want to just take a moment to thank again, Sakshi Chandra for leading the conversation with Monica. We have learned so much um, from both of you. And I, I'm sure that you all feel that we could probably listen to more all day from both of these incredible women and all of you who've joined us today. So I just want to thank them for, for putting making the time to have this conversation with all of you. Thank all of you for joining us. Um, and as we usually do with our Global Citizen Circle programs, if you'd like, I know we're at time now, so if you have to leave, please do. Don't feel guilty about that. But we will hang in here. If you have any, anything you'd like to you know, chat about, we will be here for as long as you all would like to be. So um, please uh, have, a, have a wonderful day. And, and do remember that, um, yes, these, the, the issues that, that everyone has been talking about today uh, are so difficult and, and it can be very, um, can, can be hard to feel heartened. But I, I just want to remind everybody that really it is those little things that you can do, each person in their own way, the, the things that you can do to make a difference. That is um, what I'd encourage everybody to do. And because it is, it is, as Monica said, and it is, as Archbishop Tutu said uh, so many times, that it's all of those little works, those little good things that we do that, that add up and make the kind of change that we want to see. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Theo. And thank you to everyone. And thank you to Saskia for being such a wonderful companion today. Um, I'm going to have to rush off because, yes. believe it or not, I have to go to a funeral of a friend who just passed. Oh, sorry. So take care, everyone. Thank you, Monica. Okay. You so believe it or not. Hope you'll see you in Boston sometime soon. Absolutely. Would love that. That will be the highlight. Take Great. care. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.
Sakshi, thank you. Of course, Theo. Uh, this was such a wonderful conversation. A lot of, uh, I think a lot of what we discussed today is going to stick I around. wish we could have gotten back to more of your stories, <laughs> but there was so much that people wanted to there's, talk about in the, there's, and, there's, and uh, uh, we, we'll have to do it again. We'll, we'll, you're so wonderful that we'll, we'll bring you on again. You'll have to um, share more of your experience with all of us. No, of course, Theo. This was wonderful. And thank you to everyone, you know, who was listening in. Um, it's so important to have attentive ears and just to have somebody's equivocal attention, um, you know, especially for stories that have been unheard um, and give that room and make it a safe space. So this was this was incredible. Um, I also have to run, <laughs> but yes. uh, this is this has been really I wonderful. hope you're not running. I hope you don't have to run to another exam, Sakshi. No, 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 no. I am done with those. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Yay. That's great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm done with All those. All right. Well, thank Bye. you again. Thank you so much. And I'll see everyone again soon. Bye, Sakshi. Bye. <sighs> well. Thanks again, Theo. <laughs> You're batting a thousand. <laughs> oh, thank you, Angela. I'm so happy you were here. You are always with us, and we're so grateful for your participation in these circles. It's great to see you. <laughs> My pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'd like to contribute something, if if possible. Of course. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think about when I'm looking at uh, uh, the invasion of Ukraine is that it's the history of the black struggle in this country and the history of struggles obviously around the world and you, you'll see I'm flying the Ukrainian colors in the background here mm -hmm. uh, but what I wanted to do if uh, if you will indulge me is to the first vo first verse of lift every voice and sing by James Weldon Johnson and his brother and so I'm just, I have not, I have not vocalized or warmed up, but we're among friends. So y'all have to pay, y'all have to bear with me. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has brought taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on to victory is won. Oh, thank you, Janet. That was so beautiful. I wish that more people had been able to hear it, but It'll no, I, I just, I just, I felt within my heart. I just oh. wanted to share that, you know, uh, you. un, 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 unvocalized, unrehearsed today. <laughs> but it was just, it just says so much about yeah. what we're talking about and where we are, and that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and we've got to march on mm -hmm. till victory is won. And so the last thing, which I usually end my speeches with. Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday.